Hey everybody, good evening. This is Chris Smith from the Option Club and uh, this evening I have Craig Hilsenroth with me and uh, Craig is a, a Wall Street software uh, programmer and uh, is going to talk to us tonight about a concept called expected value. Um, what I want to remind everyone is that tonight's presentation is uh, it's an educational presentation which means that it is not intended to serve as investment advice or tax advice or any other type of advice, but uh, simply as an uh, opportunity to learn about the concept of expected value and how we might use it uh, for investment and trading purposes. And uh, I also want to remind you that any uh, examples that we might uh, give you are just that. They're examples for illustration purposes and they're not any kind of representation of an actual uh, or expected return that you will or w might hope to uh, achieve in your portfolio. Um, the uh, presentation is being recorded, uh, so I'll make the video available as soon as uh, I am able to do that. And uh, I also wanted to let you know, uh, we'll, we'll put the uh, link up again, but if you look in your chat window, you should have a link to Craig's website and uh, he's published a white paper that you can get uh, by going to his site and uh, I think if you uh, put an email address in that white paper will be delivered to you. Uh, but with that, Craig, are you ready to go? I'm ready. All right, I'm going to make you the presenter and uh, you should have control of the screen now. Okay. You'll, you'll need to push the uh, play button or the show your screen button. Okay, and there it is. Okay, here it is. Okay. Let me get to the, there we go. Okay, thank you, Chris, for having me, and, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, I know your time is valuable, and I hope uh, you'll enjoy this presentation. Um, I, I'll assume that everyone can hear me, and if not, send a message, and uh, Chris will, will let me know. Uh, uh, I have to put this disclaimer up. I paid my lawyer good money uh, to write it up, so I'll leave it up here for a few seconds. And uh, so everybody's read it, and now we can move on. Okay, one of the advantages of investing with options is that mathematical models can be used to compute a theoretical value for the options. The theoretical value can then be compared to market prices to determine whether trading opportunities exist. Using some of the statistical techniques that underlie option pricing, one can also construct measurements of uh, option performance. One such measure is expected return. Expected return is a statistical measure of a position's estimated return on investment. In this presentation, we'll first examine the calculation of expected value. Uh, the expected value is used in many diverse industries and situations, including manufacturing, medical research, gaming, and finance. It is also the basis for the computation of expected return. The first section examines how expected value is calculated and provides examples on how casinos use probability and expected value to make their profits. Unlike casinos, where the probabilities are known and constant, uh, those associated with an option position's expected profit are based on assumptions about future market conditions. The second section shows how to calculate expected profit for an option position with an emphasis on how to compute the probabilities. Uh, simply using expected profit to compare positions is not sufficient, though, to make an informed decision. A position with high expected profit may entail a large amount of risk, and a position with a lower expected profit but lower risk may be more desirable. Uh, the next section uh, examines how expected return is calculated and used to compare positions. As you'll see, calculating the expect expected return is a somewhat complex undertaking. And in the last section, we'll see the basics of how uh, to use a spreadsheet program to compute expected profit and tie everything together. Uh, and then after that, uh, we can have a question and answer period for, uh, for anyone who's got any questions. OK. Um, before we go on, uh, after earning a bachelor's degree in computer science with a minor in math in 1984, I began my career as a software engineer in the financial services industry. Over the past 30 years, I have developed applications and systems for traders, portfolio managers, and, and risk managers for many types of organizations. 
I began trading stocks from my own account in the late 80s and moved on to options in the late 90s. I'm now the owner of Hillco Financial Software. In addition to consulting for a financial services company, uh, we are marketing a pre-trade analysis tool for option traders. Option Workbench helps traders to find opportunities, compare strategies, and uh, perform risk analysis. As part of its strategy comparison and risk analysis tool set, Option Workbench employs the technique, techniques covered in this presentation. Okay, so what is expected value? In plain language, the expected value is the best estimate of a value at some point in the future. The estimate is calculated by computing the weighted average sum of a set of possible values. Ideally, we'd like to use all possible values to calculate the expected value, but that's not always possible. In general, the weighted average is calculated using this formula, where each x is multiplied by a weight represented by w. Uh, for this simple uh, average, the weight associated with each value is divided by the total number of values, or n, in the formula. For the expected value calculation, uh, the weight for each value is the probability of that value occurring. So how do we calculate the probabilities? Uh, the probability associated with a particular value is found by taking the ratio of the number of times the number can occur divided by the total number of observations. A simple type of this calculation is the roll of a single die. The probability of rolling any of the numbers on the die is 1 out of 6, or 16 and 2 thirds percent. All right, to make this a little more interesting, suppose a game was constructed where a player picks a number from 1 to 6 and rolls a fair die. The operator pays out 3 to 1 on the bet if the player's number comes up on the die. So if a player bets $25 and his number comes up, the operator would give him back $100, their $25 bet plus $75. At first glance, this might like, seem like a good way for the operator to lose $75, but applying the expected value calculation reveals a different story. The two possible values for this game are minus 75 and plus 25. The probability of the operator having to pay out $75 is one-sixth, and the property of him keeping the $25 is five-sixths. So the expected value of this game is eight and a third. In other words, on average, the operator would expect to make $8.33 per bet. Uh, this also illustrates that the expected value need not be one of the possible outcomes. So we'll go on to a, a slightly more complex game, uh, a roulette wheel, to drive this point home. Uh, so the, the, val the expected value of a roulette wheel from the perspective of the house is uh, a wheel, excuse me, a roulette wheel has slots numbered 1 to 36, half of which are colored black and the other half red. There are two additional slots numbered 0 and 00, zero, zero, zero color, uh, colored green for a total of 38 slots. Uh, there are two main types of bets that can be made at a roulette wheel. In the first type of bet, the gambler picks a number from 1 to 36, and if that number comes up, the gambler gets paid 35 times the amount bet. In the second type of bet, the gambler picks a color, uh, black or red, and if the color comes up, the gambler receives a 2 to 1 payout. So if $1 is wagered uh, on red and the ball lands in a red slot, the better gets back $2. So what is the expected value uh, per $1 bet for the casino? For the first type of bet, the casino pays $35, one out of 38 spins, and keeps the dollar 37 out of 38 spins. This gives the casino about a five and a quarter cent expected value per $1 bet. For the second type of bet, the casino pays $1, 18 out of 38 spins, and keeps the dollar for 20 out of 38 spins, for the same five and a quarter cent expected value. So on average, the key casino can expect to make five and a quarter percent for every bet at a roulette wheel. If you consider the billions of dollars in revenue generated by the gaming industry every year, it's apparent that if you can play enough games with a positive expected value, your expectations need not be very high. Uh, this is all very interesting for casino operators and traveling dice games, but how does it pertain to trading options? So recalling the definition of the expected value, uh, the weighted average value of a random variable, we first need to determine which variable we want to model. 
Since the goal of placing a trade is to earn a profit, we want to determine what the expected profit of the trade is before putting it on. If the expected profit is positive, then on average we can expect to make a profit on this trade. If the expected profit is negative, then we should not do the trade. Uh, as a simple example, consider an at-the-money $50 call with 90 days to expiration. With the stock price of $50, uh, the position is put on for a $2.50 debt. Since the value of an option is partially derived from, uh, from the price of the underlying, the expected profit can be calculated by using the underlying price as a random variable. This table shows how the expected profit at expiration can be calculated. The table shows nine possible values of the underlying stock at expiration. Uh, the probability that the stock will be at that price in 90 days, the value of the call for the underlying price, and the P&L of the position. The final uh, column shows the product of the profit and probability columns. Each cell in the probable profit column corresponds to a term in the weighted average sum formula we saw earlier. At the bottom of the, uh, of the probable profit column is the expected profit of $1.85. Analysis of the data in the table reveals some important properties of the expected profit calculation. Two principal differences from the die roll and roulette wheel examples are evident. First, in practical terms, all possible values of the variable cannot be known. Since the price of the underlying can take on any value between zero and infinity, a range of prices will need to be selected that will give us enough confidence in the resulting expected profit. In statistics, this range is called a confidence interval. The second question is, how do we determine the probabilities? Whereas the probabilities for the casino games are known and constant, the probabilities used to calculate the expected profit are dependent on an assumption about the price volatility of the underlying asset. Option traders are, are typically attempting to make a profit over a range of the underlying price. So as stated on the previous slide, we cannot, since we cannot know all the possible prices, we need to pick a range that will give us enough confidence in the expected profit. Predicting this range also depends on an expectation of the volatility of the underlying price over time. Since volatility measures the standard deviation of the underlying price returns, we can use standard deviations to determine the range of the prices for the desired confidence interval. Professional risk managers typically use an interval from minus three to plus three standard deviations because that range corresponds to a 99.7% .7 confidence. From a statistical perspective, this means that the underlying price return should fall within that range for 99.7% of the observations. This formula shows how to calculate what the underlying price is for a given number of standard deviations. P sub zero is the current price. E is the natural exp uh, exponential constant. Uh, in statistics, the Greek letter sigma is commonly used to designate the standard deviation or volatility in this case, and N is the number of standard deviations. For the long call, long call example, let's assume a 25% annualized volatility. The first step we need to take is to scale the volatility to the 90-day period to expiration. This is accomplished by applying the square root of time rule and results in a 14.94% volatility. For the 99% confidence interval, the price at minus three standard deviations is $31.94, and the price at plus three standard deviations is $78.28. The next question that arises is how to pick the prices in between the endpoints. Using the equation on the previous slide, P sub n can be determined for any number of standard deviations. So the objective is to pick some increment of n that will result in enough prices to obtain an acceptable sampling, but not so many as to make the calculation too time consuming. As it turns out, this is closely related to how the probability, uh, probabilities are calculated. Uh, so now let's turn our attention to how to calculate the probabilities and tie it all together later. In 1973, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes published a paper defining the now famous Black-Scholes option pricing model. One of the characteristics of the Black-Scholes model is that it assumes that the underlying assets' daily returns follow a log-normal distribution. The reason for this assumption is so that the model can, determine, uh, can estimate the probability that the option will expire in the money 
and earn a profit for the option buyer. There are two concepts that need to be understood in order to comprehend how the probabilities are calculated. The probability density function, or PDF, and the cumulative density function, referred to as the CDF. This figure shows a typical probability density function. The PDF tells us the frequency at which we can expect the log return to change by a certain number of standard deviations. However, this is not the probability. As indicated uh, by the diagram, the probability is represented by the area under the PDF. Taking the sum of the numbers uh, representing the area between minus 3 and plus 3 standard deviations results in the 99.7% uh, confidence interval. To calculate the probabilities, uh, we need to use the, uh, know the area under the PDF uh, for the number of standard deviations represented by the price range. This is accomplished by using the cumulative density function, or CDF. This chart shows the CDF for the normal distribution depicted on the previous slide. It's important to note that the, a point on the CDF designates the probability of the variable being less than or equal to the number of standard deviations. Therefore, the probability of the price moving zero or less standard deviations is 50%. Likewise, the probability of the price moving more than uh, zero standard deviations is also 50%. How does this help us uh, to derive the probabilities we need to calculate the expected profit? Another property of the CDF is that it can be used to calculate the probability of the price falling in an interval on the curve. This is accomplished by subtracting the probability at the lower end of the interval from the probability at the upper end of the interval, as shown in this formula. Referring back to the expected profit example from earlier, the probabilities stated in the second column were actually determined by using the formula above at a $5 interval. So the 23.82% probability of the underlying being at 55 is actually the probability of the price being between 50 and 55. For that simple example, a $5 interval was sufficient. However, for actual uh, trading, a much smaller interval is needed. Before deciding on what interval is appropriate, there's a trade-off that needs to be considered. In the example position, computing the probability and the value of the call are both multi-step complex calculations. As such, performing these calculations too many times can consume a great deal of computational resources. Since the stock price cannot move less than one penny, it may seem tempting to pick a small interval around a penny. For example, the interval a half cent above and below the price will yield a very precise probability. In the examples, uh, the range from 3194 to 7828 would result in 4,634 prices to consider. If the volatility were to increase to 50%, the number of calculations goes up to 10,214. As it turns out, the probabilities using the one penny range are so minuscule that the extra computations are not worth the effort. A better solution that results in more than adequate results is to divide the range into equal sized chunks. The objective is to choose a chunk size that results in a small enough difference in the probabilities without incurring undue computational expense. Given that the endpoints of the range are defined as minus three and plus three standard deviations, it makes sense to use an increment of standard deviations to divide the range. For example, using 1 1 28th of a standard deviation, which is a nice round computer number, divides the six standard, devi six standard deviation range into 768 chunks. This table shows a revision to the long call example. Uh, a new column showing the number of standard deviations has been added. So as the table shows, this long call still has a positive expectation. Uh, if the trader could buy a call like this many times, on average, a profit of $76.33 per contract would be expected. The preceding examples assume that the price returns of the underlying asset follow the log normal distribution. However, very few, if any, equities or instruments of any asset class actually exhibit this behavior. In the real world, price fluctuations are subject to shocks caused by corporate actions, natural disasters, political turmoil, and other exogenous events. Single-day price moves of four or more standard deviations are not uncommon. 
This means that the probability of extreme changes is higher than would be predicted by the normal distribution, leading to the understatement of the probable profit at the extremes, or tails of the distribution. This fact calls into question the value of using the standard statistical techniques outlined above. In fact, there are many techniques employed by professional risk managers that apply adjustments to the normal distribution. These so-called parametric approaches attempt to account for extreme return fluctuations in a generalized way. There is also a non-parametric or empirical approach that can be used. This method uses historical data to construct the PDF and the CDF. The empirical approach is not generally used by professionals because they are typically dealing with large portfolios of diversified assets, and a more generalized approach is appropriate. However, for the purposes of calculating the expected profit for an option strategy, using empirical data is a reasonable approach. In the normal PDF exhibited above, the tails of the distribution decline smoothly and approach zero as the standard deviations approach negative and positive infinity. This chart, uh, generated by Option Workbench, is an example of an empirical fat-tailed uh, PDF for the S&P 500 index. The daily return data were collected for a 10-year period ending in June of 2013. The histogram, uh, in the histogram, the eight standard deviation range from minus four to plus four is divided into 128 buckets. The height of the bars indicates what percentage of the daily returns falls into each bucket. The histogram is superimposed over a normal distribution to illustrate the differences in the tails. Now, this uh, is the uh, empirical uh, CDF. Uh, so using the empirical PDF, the CDF can be instructed. Uh, this chart uh, is, uh, shows the CDF derived from the PDF in the previous slide. The red line depicts the empirical CDF and the blue line shows the log normal CDF for comparison. One difference between the two that is immediately apparent is the log normal CDF is smooth and continuous, whereas the empirical curve is not smooth and nor continuous. The SPX PDF used to construct the CDF is missing some bars at the upper end buckets. Even if all the buckets contain data, the empirical CDF would still not be uh, continuous. Uh, furthermore, recall that to calculate the expected profit, a very small increment of standard deviations was used. Since the log normal C, uh, CDF is a continuous function, a value for any number of standard deviations can be computed. This is not the case for the empirical CDF. So for values that are not points on the CDF curve, an interpolation method will need to be used to determine the probabilities. One of the trade-offs between using the, an empirical CDF versus a log normal CDF is that the former offers an accurate approximation of tail risk, while the latter offers a better approximation of the probabilities. Another point to consider is what data are used to construct the PDF. The SPX PDF uh, was constructed using, uh, oh, if the SPX PDF were constructed using only three years of daily data, the 2008 financial crisis would not have been included. There are valid reasons for selecting both time frames, time frames depending on circumstances. One could also choose to use weekly or monthly returns to construct the PDF. All of these choices will affect the shape of the CDF. In summary, a fat tail distribution can offer a better estimate of expected profit, but there is not one correct fat tail distribution. An option trader who would like to use a fat tail distribution should be aware of what assumptions were made in constructing the PDF. <clears throat> While having a positive expected profit is preferable, it's not always sufficient. A trade with positive expectation can still result in loss, so attention must be paid to risk. Expected return, the expected profit divided by the risk, tells an option strategist whether the trade is worth the risk. In the long call example above, the risk is $2.50, the cost of the call. So the expected return is approximately 30.53%. Suppose now that the cost of the call was actually $3.15. Now that would reduce the expected profit to approximately $0.12 cents for an expected return of 3.65%. So even though the trade still has a positive expectation, a, re a return of 3.65% does not seem worth the risk. Now, this conclusion is subjective and has to be weighed against alternative uses 
of the trading capital. Perhaps 3.65% is not a bad return given general market conditions. This type of comparison highlights another use of expected return. Similar to the comparison on the previous slide, different positions can be compared using expected return. The final step is to normalize the returns. Normalization is necessary because the positions under consideration may have different strike prices, times to expirations, and even different underlying assets. Suppose a trader wants to compare the long call analyzed above with a 45-day call for a price of a uh, dollar, uh, oh, sorry, uh, for, for a price of a dollar 85. The expected profit of the new call position is approximately 39 cents for an expected return of 21.25%. So the question is, would the trader prefer 21.25% over 45 days or 30.53% over 90 days? The reason this needs to be considered is that the proceeds from the 45-day trade, oops, there's a typo on the slide. Uh, can be in re reinvested for the 45 days in between the two expiration dates. I'll have to fix that typo. <clears throat> uh, this equation shows how to calculate the compound annualized return. Uh, using this formula, the original 90-day trade yields 294.65% on an annualized basis, and the 45-day trade yields 477.36%. This shows that the 45-day call has an edge over the 90-day call, and the trader should prefer, uh, prefer the new position. So now I'm going to try to tie this all together. Uh, and what I'll do is actually bring up the spreadsheet that I used to calculate, to do all the numbers in here, to show that you can actually use a spreadsheet to do this. And that is right here. Okay, here we go. So it looks a little complicated, and, and you can see there are a lot of numbers to calculate. So here I put in the, uh, the days to expiration, the $50 strike price, uh, the 25% volatility assumption, and this is the calculation for the period vol, and this is uh, my price range. So here if I change this to 50%, that shows that the price range uh, changes pretty dramatically. Um, going back to 25%, um, I can see here, here's the expected profit, um, the, the uh, period return, the compound annualized return, and I also have uh, the simple annualized return in here. Uh, some people like to use the simple return because the compound returns assumes that you're reinvesting the capital uh, for the period. Um, which you are, even if you have the money in a, in a money market account, it's sitting there earning some interest. So uh, I think uh, using the compound uh, return is a little bit better. And now I can change the, you know, to compare it to the 45-day trade, I can change that to 45 and that to 185. And there I get the 39% profit and uh, the, uh, pro the corresponding returns. So you can, you, you can do this in a spreadsheet, and these are all uh, using uh, spread, spreadsheet functions, the norm disk function uh, with different, uh, different values. Uh, this is calculating the probabilities. Uh, here we have the P&L and then the expected profit. And if I go all the way down, you know, I have 768 different numbers here. Um, so this is a, a, little bit easier, it's a, a little bit easier way of doing it than doing it by, by paper. Um, but what I'd also like to show is how I can do this also uh, in Option Workbench. And actually here is the uh, empirical PDF and CDF for the uh, SPX uh, example, or the SPX example that I looked at. And here I have the 10-year period, and you can see uh, the CDF curve. If I go down to three years, that changes the shape of the curve and that would affect any uh, expected profit and expected return calculation that I'd be doing there. Uh, another thing I wanted to show is, is how you can use uh, the expected annualized expected return to uh, compare strategies. 
and I did a little scan before, and I, I picked a couple of cover calls on IBM. Uh, this is the IBM uh, distribution, and again, I can uh, I usually use uh, three years uh, when I do these calculations for what I'm doing. You can see how that uh, how that looks, and if I come over to strategy analysis, I have a couple of covered calls here. A uh, short term, a July 190 and a July 195 call, and what I'll do is. Uh, sort this by the expected return and then I can see that in this right now before I made any changes the 190 call uh, has, a, has a slight edge but if I go into my volatility shifts and I use the the fat tail CDF for three years I'll change that one and on, now I don't know if you notice but now the 195 uh, flipped to the top and it has the advantage but I'll want to make the same uh, some, oh, I did that already. Sorry about that. Let me go to the 190. I want to make the same assumptions for the 190. Okay, so the 195 you know, has a better, uh, better expected value or better expected uh, profit. Even though the 190 call has a higher expected profit, the 195 call has a higher expected return because the uh, the risk is a little bit less. Uh, and in here, I'm applying the expected value calculation to the risk also. So the cost of the covered call, this is just a one lot, would be you know, almost $19,000 in both cases. But using the expected value calculation, uh, I would only expect to risk about $4,500 you know, $4, and $5,000 respectively. And uh, I can also compare this to another you know, popular uh, substitution for a cover call because uh, a, a lot of people um, you know this is an expensive stock and you don't want to lay out all the money for that cover call so we can do a diagonal calendar spread um, and I and I looked before where I want to buy the uh, the 185 call and I'll sell the uh, the 200 and in this case I'm going to do 10 lots and I want to do the January, uh, I'm sorry, the July, January. Okay, so now I, I put this in and I automatically get a, uh, this one goes right to the top because it has a much better expected value, but I haven't changed my assumptions yet. And I'll just change that and we'll see that even though the, this, the, uh, <coughs> the diagonal calendar spread still has a, the edge over these other things. Okay, so at this point, um, I'll open up for questions. And Chris, I think you can see the questions. I'm not seeing them on my my screen here. All right, let me uh, pull up the questions. So, uh, if you have any questions, there you should have a question box that's on on your screen. You can go ahead and uh, just type the question in there. And uh, at, and what what we'll do is we'll we'll look, try to group them all together in in, in uh, you know the same same subject matter. Um, uh, we have, we have a question from uh, we have a question about the the data source for Workbench. Uh, can, okay. Can you tell them a little bit about where the data comes from? Okay, uh, Option Workbench, uh, we're marketing this in, in, uh, as a joint venture with uh, Macmillan Analysis Corporation. That's uh, Lord Larry Macmillan's uh, company, uh, the Option Strategist. He's got a product called the Strategy Zone, and that's a, got a, it's a database and a, and a lot of reports. So that's the primary source for the data. Um, there are other sources, but primarily it comes from the, the Strategy Zone. Okay, and uh, we have a question about whether this is part of the, the Macmillan uh, offering. Uh, it, it's a uh, subscription subscription service uh, in addition to the Strategy Zone subscription. Okay, uh, we have a question about the volatility input. Where where that that's coming from? Um, which on the when I was doing these volatility shifts. Yeah, I, th I think the basic idea is is that they're questioning, you know, the estimate of future volatility. Um, 
you know, how, how you're, you're choosing that. Okay, so in this case, uh, we're looking at the diagonal calendar spreads. So since it's a long Vega trade, you know, Option Workbench tries to be conservative in its estimate. And in this case, it, it took the lower of the uh, 20, 50, and 100 day volatility, which was 16%. Uh, I can also go in here and, and change this volatility expectation, and that will affect the expected profit. Let's say I'll go with the 100 day, the, the 21%. And if I go in here and hit 21% and then apply, uh, that lowered the expected profit, but it, this one still has an edge. Um, but I would still like to go in and do that for all the rest of them. Well, so it picked 21% for the uh, covered rights because they are uh, they're negative vega. And uh, in a negative vega trade, you want volatility to go down. So it, it tried to be conservative and, and pick the higher of the volatility. So actually, this is probably a more uh, correct analysis of these three positions because we're, we're using the same volatility assumptions on all three of them. Uh, I, did that answer the question? Um, I, I, I think it probably did. Uh, okay. If not, if not uh, you know, feel free to you know, throw up another uh, question to kind of you know, define it a little bit better. Uh, we also have a question about um, uh, what what levels or what choices there are in terms of subscribing to the to the software or purchasing the software? Uh, it's a monthly subscription. Um, if you if you use uh, an auto renewal, it's one hundred twenty five dollars a month, and uh, for a single month, uh, month by month, it'll be one thirty five. And then there's a, a break for buying a year up front. You basically get. Uh, a month free, so 12 months for the price of 11. Okay. And the, uh, uh, the, the data or the, the service, is, is it a real-time service or end of day? Uh, it's end of day at this time. Okay. We're, we're, uh, we're talking to uh, various brokers about uh, piggybacking off of their real-time feeds uh, for you know, option workbench clients that are also brokerage clients of the broker. Um, so there's a lot of negotiation that has to go on to, <laughs> to get that working. But that is something that we're working on and hope to have uh, a couple of brokers lined up by the end of the year. Okay. So then is, it will be real time. Is this available for, for futures and is there additional cost for that? Uh, it is available for, for futures, and the, the futures data is uh, included in the package. Okay. And then uh, does it run natively on a Mac? Um, no, it's actually, I'm running on a Mac. Um, it'll run on, uh, on Windows also. Um, every, all, it's, uh, everything's the same. It looks a little bit different. Um, it's actually, from a technology perspective, it's, it's a Java web start application. So... Um, once you subscribe, uh, it will automatically download the software, and whenever there's an update, uh, you know, a new version or a bug fix, that automatically gets downloaded. So there's no, there's no, you know, installing from a CD and then buying upgrades and all that kind of stuff. It just, you, you use it, and as soon as a new version is available, uh, you, you it automatically downloads. Okay. Uh, can you show some of the strategies or? Basically, the question is, uh, what strategies are included with the software? Uh, I'm, well, I'm not really sure what that question is. There, there are ways to search for uh, calendar spreads, covered calls, naked puts, and straddle buys, uh, you know, in the universe. And you know, basically, the way I found the IBM trades here, I have this. I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, Basically, uh, on the strategy zone, if you can look down at the bottom left here, uh, at, at the close of business uh, yesterday, there were almost 10,000 covered calls that were analyzed there. And uh, what I did was I have, you, you can use uh, filters to filter through those. And I just, I have a list, a watch list that I call blue chips, and I just look for, um, you know, covered calls from that list of stocks with an acceptable uh, annualized return if it's uh, uh, expired or, or signed, sorry, uh, with less than 150 days. So there's a lot of different ways that you can that you can filter these 
these formulas are very flexible. Uh, but that's just how I happen to find those. Um, and then you can, if it go back to the strategy and uh, This go-to software just uses up a lot of resources <laughs> on machines. Here we go. Uh, in terms of what you can analyze, you can you can put anything in. There are convenient uh, what I call spread builders for all the different uh, popular strategies. There's also a custom builder that you can uh, use to you know build any kind of crazy thing that you want, uh, which I'm want to do. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question here that says, what is a better indicator of success on a trade uh, probability or actually let me let me repeat that. What is a better indicator of success on a, I think what they're saying is what's a better indicator of success? Trade probability or probability of profit or probability of maximum profit? Um, well, I I think uh, expected profit is uh, is the best indicator of success uh, because you uh, the probability of profit uh, it's all taking probabilities into account but the expected profit is a little bit more rigorous uh, than the other two from a from a mathematical perspective um, and you know just in my experience you hardly ever get the maximum profit I mean even if you're selling you know deep out of the money puts. Um, you usually want to buy buy them back on the expiration day for a nickel, just in case. Um, and you know, personally, I, I usually don't hold uh, trades to expiration. Uh, I, I look at the expected profit, and you know, if I make the expected profit before the the target date, then all the better. Then I have a much better expected return, and uh, I'll, I'll get out early. Um, can't lose money by or you can't go broke by making money so um, does the software allow one to monitor trades that are in progress um, in an upcoming version you'll be able to do that uh, that, that version is not quite ready for prime time that's another uh, future release okay and then um, can, it, can it simulate trades and display both live trades along with proposed simulated trades um, well, what, what you're looking at is a simulation. Um, you can also do back testing. Um, so, for example, uh, if I could go back, um, go back six months uh, to, let's say, January 16th, and uh, try, a, you know, you know, a five dollar out of the money cover call. You know, I'm not sure if this is actually going to uh, going to work. So 195 will go for the 16th. Uh, it doesn't have a, a good expected profit. But then I, uh, I can click the, uh, the back test report here. And what it's doing now is it's gathering the data from uh, January 16th to February 16th. And then it's go going to uh, produce a report uh, that shows how this trade would have done. Uh, what another uh, future release, you know, it's coming also by the end of the year, we're uh, creating a simulator where you can uh, mark points, you know, uh, on the dates or, or conditions in the market where you might want to do adjustments to the trade. You know, you might not want to do that for a cover call, but uh, if you're doing something that's uh, gamma neutral and you're, you're doing uh, gamma scalping, you might want to adjust uh, at some point and, uh, you know, buy or sell stock something like that. Um, let me do the, show the report. So I click that and it'll show this uh, back test report in the browser. Okay, so this one actually did make money. Um, you can see that it it shows what the uh, the data looked like for that day uh, that we put it on for the option. It gives you the the chart, and then uh, tells you for each day uh, the underlying price, the implied volatility of the trade, 
and what your unrealized P&L is, the margin, your return, and then the Greeks for the trade. So ended up this one made, you know, nine and a half percent over that, you know, one month period. So not bad. And the uh, software will handle iron condors. Sure, sure. I can. Uh, let's go back to today. I can go here, sell an iron condor, and uh, you know, do it for the twentieth. So ten dollars and. Five dollar wingspan, let's say, and there's your iron condor. You can also uh, do evaluations for intermediate dates. So let's say I want to see how it'll look, you know, just you know, the end of this week, and then the middle of next week. Okay, and it shows you expect. And this table in the lower right here, as I'm moving around, it shows you the values that you're looking at, including uh, the probabilities. Theoretical P&L, expected profit on those dates, and the Greeks. Okay. Um, and that, by the way, that ranked lowest on our <laughs> on their expected re annualized expected return list. <laughs> now, uh, I mentioned a, a white paper at the beginning of the uh, presentation. Uh, do you do you want to tell folks a little bit about? Uh, what the white paper covers? Uh, well, sure. The uh, the white paper, uh, basic or the the presentation, is uh, based on the information. The white paper. The white paper goes into a little bit more detail on the uh, on the calculations. Uh, but uh, and you can download it by just going to the uh, optionworkbench.com uh, homepage, and you just uh, fill in your name and email address, and uh, it'll be downloaded. Um, so. It, it's it's the same information as the presentation, uh, just in a little bit more detail. Okay. And um, I already posted in both the uh, question box as well as in the, the chat window the, the link, which is to uh, it's the, the uh, link is just optionworkbench.com, uh, but you should be able to click on it uh, in, in the chat window, and that'll take you to the same web page that's on the screen right now. And then um, let's see. Uh, we've got one other question. It says, "Can you show an example of selling an option or, or spread with a negative expected return?" Sure. <laughs> Those are usually easy to find. Uh, let's see. Let's try to sell. Uh, put for this week a 190 put. Let, let's try that. That that has negative expected return, right off the bat. So that shows, you know, we get uh, you know not much credit for that. You know that that's this week, um, and it's got a negative expected profit, negative expected return, negative annualized return. Uh, I'm not you know not saying that all short puts are negative expected return, but it's it's kind of easy to find one of those. Uh, does the software handle weekly options? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, every, yeah. Uh, we, we don't have right now the are those uh, the mini contract, the ten dollar, uh, you know, the ten the ten lot contracts. But you can you know you can take the values that you that you get from the uh, you know the hundred, you know hundred share size and divide them by ten. That, that's really all that there is to that. Uh. What should a, a trader use as the risk-free rate of return? Um, well, in Option Workbench, you can set it to whatever you want. What it what it defaults to is the uh, the ninety-day T-bill index, whatever that the value for that the closing value for what that was for that. Um, but you can you can use whatever you want. I know some people like to use you know two and a half percent, but you know it's kind of that's kind of Ridiculous in this in this environment. You're never going to get that in a money market account. Um, so you know probably the best you can do is you know the the T-bill rate. All right, I think I think we've uh, gone through all of the questions, uh, Craig. Okay. 
So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to wrap the presentation up. Uh, Craig, is there a, a way that folks can contact you if they have questions after? Sure, today? sure. Uh, let me bring the the presentation back up, and I'll go to the last slide. Um, and it'll show my contact information. Okay. So just send me an email um, at support at optionworkbench.com and uh, I'll be happy to talk to you. I like talking about this stuff. <laughs> okay. And I think you had a, a special offer for anyone who was interested in taking a look at the software. Right, and uh, the next uh, couple or three days, you know, maybe early next week, you'll be getting an email uh, with a link to uh, try do a, a buy one month, uh, get one month free for the you know, discounted $125 rate. So uh, that's really a $270 value for uh, $125. Uh, so that'll be emailed to attendees of the of the uh, webinar. All right. So I, I think that's. Uh... I'm looking through the questions. I don't see any uh, questions that we haven't answered. So I, I think we're going to call it an evening and let everyone go have their uh, dinner or uh, get to bed if you're on the East Coast. <laughs> and uh, Glass of wine for me. There you go. And uh, I'll get the video processed and posted, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Well, and thank you, everyone, from the Option Club. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and uh, good night, Craig. Enjoy the wine. Good night. Thank you.